Good morning. I'm glad you're able to take a moment to attend to worship. And uh, the announcements for today are many. And so I'm actually going to take those and move them to a separate video or a separate announcement. Uh, we have some we have some clarity about what the fall of this year will look like for the church. And, and so I want to make sure to share all that and then be able to answer any questions because, you know, it's 2020s. You never know what's going to happen next. Uh, the reading today, we are looking at the end of the Lord's Prayer, and so the, the reading for, this today, for that day, for this, for this topic today, echoes that. It is the prayer, the song that uh, Jesus' mother sings. Uh, it's in Luke 146. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant, surely. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. He has shown strength with his arms. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. On occasion, as you are reading through your study Bible, you will come across a phrase in the notes, in the footnotes to the text. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen occasionally. And that phrase, which I've always found a bit obtuse and confusing, is other ancient authorities. You see, you'll be reading along, you'll see a footnote for the verse you're looking at, and you'll look down for the footnote and it'll say, other ancient authorities lack, or other ancient authorities include. And that's what you'll find if you look at the end of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 6.13. If you're reading from a King James version of the Bible, you will read, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. That's what you'd expect to find. That's how churches across the world have pray the Lord's Prayer every week. But if you read the NRSV, another, uh, the NRSV is actually sort of the grandson of the King James. The King James, the authorized standard version, that then was another authorized standard version, then the revised standard version, then the new revised standard version. So it's in the lineage of King James, it, the, the NRSV is. And so if you read the same verse in the NRSV, what you'll find is, and do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. And then there'll be a footnote. In my copy, it's a little letter L. And if you look at the footnote, it'll say, other ancient authorities have in some form, for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. Other ancient authorities are other old copies of the Bible. I wish that's what it actually said. Other old copies of the Bible, or, or other of our oldest copies of the Bible do or do not have this. But we have copies of the Bible that go all the way back to the second century AD. Like we, there are more copies of the Bible uh, from ancient times than of any other book ever. Right? There are people whose job it was, was to create clean copies. Here, make a perfectly clean, accurate copy of this book and do it all by hand. And that's what people's jobs were. And so there's this whole uh, part of, of, of uh, culture that was full of people who were just copying books accurately. And so we have these book that copies of the Bible from all over uh, the world, all over the known world at that point. And, and almost all of the time, those ancient copies of the Bible line up. This is one of the few times it does not, here in Matthew 6, 13. Some of the oldest copies of the Bible have, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, and some don't. Now, if we go back into that time frame, we go back to, we, we know that people were ending the Lord's Prayer with that phrase in worship as early as 120 AD because we have the book called the Didache that was used to teach uh, people how to worship, teach people how to be Christian. And so we know that's how people were taught how to end the Lord's Prayer as early as 120 AD. We know that that was part of the Jewish tradition of prayer to pray 
pray for God's power and glory and kingdom. We know that it was something that Jesus would have been taught, and thus Jesus would have prayed it. We know that it is something that Jesus talked about often about kingdom. And so uh, to say other ancient authorities uh, did not include this, you know, maybe that, that that's true. But this is how Christians prayed going back to almost the beginning. And so I'm, I'm okay with ending the prayer like this. I, it doesn't, I'm not worried about it. And mostly I just want you to understand what it means when it says other ancient authorities. Well, it means other old copies of the Bible may, may or may not have had this, this part. Not actually pray this, to pray for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory is to talk about what is glorious and powerful. It is to talk about what a kingdom makes possible. At that time, when this was first being prayed, the power and the glory was of the, the Roman Empire, of that kingdom. And it was a powerful kingdom indeed. It could create glorious and powerful uh, objects and buildings. I have stood in one of them, one of the most glorious examples of architecture from the Roman Empire is the Pantheon. The Pantheon, I, I can tell you it's dimensions. It's 141 feet wide, 141 feet tall, and, and to light it, there is no artificial lights in the first century. There is a hole in the ceiling that is 26 feet across. It's a huge building. It's made of only concrete. There's no, like, rebar hasn't been invented, right? So it, it's, it's an amazing piece of uh, architecture to do this. <laughs> to understand how glorious it is to be in there, I think it's best for me to tell you that it, it rained when I was in the Pantheon. It rained when I was in the Pantheon because that's how the light comes in. The sun shines through this 26-foot hole in the ceiling of the Pantheon. And, and it is such a big building that I watched it rain in front of me from far enough back that I didn't get wet. It didn't even bother me. It rained in the building I stood in, and it was just, that's how it was designed. It was designed to be rained into. It was that big. All right. That is truly a glorious building. It, it was, it, the dome on the Pantheon is the biggest dome, man-made dome, and that was true until the 15th century when uh, the Duomo was built. Like, it's just very impressive. And in the face of all of this very impressive, glorious uh, exhibition by the Roman Empire, by that kingdom, the first Christians learned to pray to a different kingdom. They, rule, they were ruled by a king whose mother sang the following. Right? When, when Mary is pregnant with Jesus, this is what she sings. As I read earlier, the, the, the center part is how he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones. He has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Right? This is a kingdom that is powerful and glorious because it handles things differently. Right? It's where the powerful are not on the throne, where the lowly are lifted up, the hungry are filled, and the rich are sent away empty. That's the glory of the kingdom that we pray for. <laughs> Something that... Early Christians found to be more glorious even than with the Pantheon with its 26-foot hole in the center of the ceiling. The king of this glory, the king who is found in glo his glory, the glory is not that of a throne that he sits on, but he is raised on a cross from which he forgives. That is his glory. And the power which undergirds this, the kingdom and the glory, the power that undergirds it is the power of resurrection. The power that is willing to suffer out of love for another, trusting on the other, that on the other side of suffering, even suffering unto death, is resurrection. Early Christians learned to pray for this resurrection, knowing that in resurrection there is life, a transformed life, full of the fruit of the Spirit. We gather weekly to pray for the kingdom that is to come gathered weekly to be rooted in the power that drives that kingdom, the power of resurrection, the power that looks at the challenges that face us and knows them to be passing and transitory, the power of forgiveness that converts tragedies into miracles, the power of reconciliation that binds together lives that are broken. We gather weekly to be part of the glory of the church gathered in the name of Jesus, sharing in a foretaste of the feast to come. 
Even in the moments when we fall, the moments when we insist on our will, when we delude ourselves into thinking that we can be self-sufficient, when we deny that we need mercy and we refuse to be merciful to others, we come together to pray this prayer again, reminding us what the God, glory of God truly is, that the glory of God truly is, as Paul describes it in his letter to the church at Philippi, that the, what makes Jesus glorious was that though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, humbling himself and becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. It is glorious to God the Father that this is how Jesus lived his life. Right? Not regarding equality as something to be glad grasped or exploited, but taking on the form of a slave. And so we pray together the Lord's Prayer, returning to Jesus and taking steps towards the, por the prayer's fulfillment, towards the kingdom and the power and its glory, a fulfillment that will last forever and ever. And that phrase, forever and ever, the Greek word there is eons. Right? An eon is a time that is so long that we cannot count it. And it's not singular in this Greek, it's plural. It's not eon, it's eons. It's, time, it's a time that you cannot count, and it's multiple of them. It's forever and ever. Forever is not long enough, right? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that last word, amen, it, it summarizes the, the, our commitment to what we have just said. To say amen is to take a pen and to sign your name to something, right? I'm in, right? This is what I'm committed to. I'm going to line up with my life with what I've just said. Like you sign your name to it and like, amen, I'm going to do it. But the thing is, to sign your name to something doesn't quite get at the joy of this. It's not the seriousness of signing a truck or a contract to buy a truck. And now, I mean, it's a joyous thing because you have a truck, but you also have a lot of debt that goes with having bought a truck. Right? It's not quite that level of serious like somberness. It's more like the ending of a grand piece of music. It's coming to the end the resounding crescendo and, and that there's a sense that this is the high point right we're building to this and I, to help get the sense of how this is experienced in prayer I think it is worth taking a moment to uh, hold hold ourselves in the way that early Christians prayed like we now pray we bow your heads and, and you, we clasp our hands and that's how we tend to pray that, that came, across, came along centuries later. The earliest Christians, the way they prayed was with their arms out and, and looking up. And, and so if you think about how that stance transforms your experience of the moment, uh, I often see musicians doing this, putting their arms out when, when they're singing and, and it's just such a high point and, and they just are trying to express something in the words and the music are moving them. And, and if you think about the way that you come to the end of this prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Right? There's a sense of we're building to that amen. And, and I could sing that to you, but, but I think it'd be better if I don't, because I think there's someone who, who would be far better to listen to to sing this. Uh, what you will find in the comments of this video is a link to another YouTube video. And you will find a link to Andrea Bocelli singing the Lord's Prayer. And, and I invite you to, uh, we're going to pray in a minute. But then, and then I'm going to wrap up, but I want you to go listen to Andrew Bocelli, and I want you to listen to him. And I want you to listen to the way that the prayer just moves until, until you get to the end. And for thine and the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen, is just like this huge crescendo. It builds to that, and it is glorious. And next time we pray the Lord's Prayer, I want us to have that sense. We don't have to sing like Andrew Bocelli. But we can sing, we can say amen with that sense of joy. Yes, so be it. 
I'm signing my name onto this and it's going to be good. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we have looked at the prayer that you have taught us over these last weeks. Having prayed it so often, may we come to these words with a renewed commitment to your kingdom and your power and your glory. May, your, may the, our, our men be as wholehearted and resounding with joy at being welcome to such a grand journey. May our amen just be a committal by us to what you're doing. We thank you for walking with us on this journey this day and always. We pray for this journey for those who are walking with us, that they might stay healthy. We pray for those who lead us, that they might decide wisely. We pray for those who are stuck right now, who are in nursing homes or in hospitals and who are grappling with these times. We pray for all these things as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I hope your Sabbath is joyous and full of that knowing the joy and the glory and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Go forth now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.